series of public lectures that we've organized as a part of the ICTS IUCA program on cosmology with the cosmic microwave background and large scale structure that's ongoing here. It's a six week program. And uh, you all know about IUCA. I should just say a couple of words about ICTS. It's a new initiative of the Tata Institute for Fundamental Research. It's the International Center for Theoretical Sciences that has been organizing major programs on frontier areas of theoretical sciences in India over the past two years. Okay, today we are privileged to have Professor Francois Boucher of the Institute for Astrophysics, Paris. And uh, Professor Boucher is also the deputy principal investigator of the Planck uh, HFI and also holds very responsible positions in charge of the data processing and he's a major leader of the cosmic microwave background observations that are going on now. A few words about Frasa, he uh, did his PhD in Paris and then postdocs at top centers like Berkeley, Princeton, Santa Barbara and he's been back in IAP for many years now and has, is one of the leaders of the scientific world in Europe and you know, France in particular. Uh, I should also mention that Francois is a very old friend of Ayuka. He's visited Ayuka over the many years. And uh, in fact, I have been taught by Francois in the school that he had organized many years back as, as a graduate student. I had benefited from those lectures. And uh, finally, I should tell you that Francois has been, you know, in his early days has worked from problems ranging from early universe cosmic strings to structure formation and various other aspects of cosmology and has moved like many cosmologists into what is hot now is to look at observations and what they reveal about the universe. So Francois is here to tell us about the new views of the oldest image of the universe. Thank you, Francois. Thank you for a very nice introduction. I'm not sure I deserve all of this, but well, it's always good to take. <laughs> So um, I will, uh, this is sort of, the purpose of this talk is sort of summarized on this first slide. Um, there, there is, um, we do have the, the benefit of a very old image of the universe due to the final, finite travel uh, time of photons, and I'll get to explain this a little bit in more detail. Um, and so we can actually image, you know, the, the universe in its infancy, and the first instrument that humanity built to actually image this was, and discover it was a COBE satellite that actually made the first image. And this is, as you can see, this is a very blurred image with a very poor angular resolution. You just see some big patches, no details. We now have in flight, okay, the WMAP satellite. And what you can see is that, well, essentially it's, it's turned from that image to that image. Okay, so if you, if you look at it, I mean, you see that there are some finer details. And, and these, so you might say, well, it just look like, you know, uh, uh, pieces of color. Uh, I try to, to, well, it turns out that this has a lot of information about the world we live in. Now, the satellite we have been building for now something like 15 years, and it's slated for launch uh, either at the end of this year or in January, is a Planck satellite, which will, you know, extract 10 times more information essentially than WMAP concerning temperature, and will add some information about another property of light, which is called polarization, which are these tiny lines that you can't see. Uh, and uh, well, the, it does turn out to contain more information. And if I just do a sort of look up, this is sort of W map resolution. This is sort of W uh, Planck resolution. And this is the kind of thing that we're trying to achieve. And I will tell you a bit why. Now, let's start with a bit of, mo of motivation. I mean, we're living around a, a, a sun in a galaxy a little bit like this one. And uh, this is sort of the building block of the large scale structures of the universe. And when you look at the, at, the, um, at the sky, and if you do the mental operation of just taking out every star and just looking at the galaxies, this was done by the fellows of the APM Galaxy Catalog uh, in Cambridge. And that's what you get. You see, you see this distribution of galaxies. And if you pick at it, I mean, you'll see that this is very inhomogeneous. I mean, you'll see the, some, some clusters here, some filaments, some under dense regions. The black part spots are, of course, where there is no data. So immediately you see that there seem to be structure on very large scales in the universe. So when I say building blocks for galaxies, I mean it. That is, to me, this will be a, a point 
which is sort of a tracer on something on a much grandiose and bigger scale. And that's the one that we refer to as large scale structure on the universe. And that's what we want to understand. Now, I gave you a 2D image. Now, it turns out without entering in the details that this fellow called Edwin Hubble made a major discovery in 1919, which is the further the objects are, um, the, 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 the faster they, they go away from us, which is a, just a signature of the overall expansion of the universe. And you can turn this to your advantage because it turns out that receding fast means that the, the color you are receiving from that object is shifted to the red. In other words, by looking at the light from a ga distant galaxies, you can, by looking at specific features which are well known in the laboratory, you can get a, a, a pretty precise assessment of how far it is from you. So now you can add the third dimension to the second, to the flat image I gave you. This was done. And I, well, when I started my PhD, I mean, there, there, this was done, there, there were hundreds of galaxies like this. Now, here, here we are, and this is each point now is a galaxy. And this is what you see when you go further and further away from us. To set the scale, the light that, is, that would be coming from this green circle would take 2.7 billion years to reach us. So we are at the center. Each dot is a galaxy. You see this very rich structure. There is no way that if you just send, send literally some sand on the, on the floor, or you would never get a structure like this. This is not random. There are all kinds of properties. And that's you know, remarkable, and we're trying to understand that. We're saying that there, is, there must be some meaning to it. Now, this is truly cosmological scales, because I just told you, I mean, 2.5 billion years for the, sky, for the light from this point to reach us. If you compare things seconds from the moon, you know, minutes from, from our own sun, we, we have really reached now cosmological scales. Now, it's just the same thing, but to sort of show you, I mean, this is just a, we are still at the center, but this is just a, as if we were sort of taking this universe, baby universe in a ball and rolling it. And this is the mapping we've been successful in doing in sort of slices. Because we haven't been, well, yet having enough telescope time to map all at that depth uh, around us. But the way this carries very well is this business of, you know, having a structure that looks like foam with essentially emptied regions surrounded by sheets. And the intersection of sheets are filaments and the intersection of filaments are clusters. And when I'm saying clusters, I'm talking clusters of galaxies, filaments of galaxies. They are, they, are, they are the tracers. So anyway, so this is what the universe looks like around us. Now, for a very long time, we, had, we, we immediately thought, well, you know, it must be gravity. I mean, you know, and, and um, the idea very early on has been to say, well, probably some mechanism very early in the history of the universe generated some tiny fluctuations, tiny little clumps of of matter and radiation when the universe was hot, young, dense. And then, you know, in the course of time, tiny fluctuation grew out and formed those structures. Now, that's a pretty simple recipe. If you, if you just say, well, let's just follow the mass. So I will lay down in the computer, which I did, uh, you know, a, a, a nearly homogeneous mass distribution. And we'll turn the gravity on. I will not show the expansion of that cube because otherwise it will go out of the screen because it's, uh, we will be expanding by a factor of a million, uh, a thousand, well, not quite, but a large factor. Um, so, this would, so this has been rescaled to be always at the same size. So the only thing you see is not the expansion, is what gravity is doing to these little uh, clumps of matter. And so we'll, to actually show that, um, so this was done on a supercomputer. And so let's look at the slice. And initially, this is just graphics, you know, initially you see some nearly homogeneous and gravity is at work. And progressively what we'll, it will do is the richer point will get richer and the poorer will get poorer. Okay. In other words, I mean, this is a, well, so th this is sort of a, a recap of the, of the action. You see that the, the, the dense part does just become denser and denser. They, they sort of swallow all the, the matter around them. And, but the basic structure is already there. So, in other words, very large patterns are just amplified, and this, uh, because you, you, and this is just playing it again so that now you know what to, to look at. Uh, so you see that this, or essentially, it's sort of this matter flow toward the richest part. So in other words, the void are progressively emptied to the benefit of the already dense uh, structures initially. Now, so let's, you know, this was uh, just a thin slice through that uh, calculation, even though the calculation was ongoing in the full cube. 
Uh, now let's have a look at the, how this, the pattern that is generated. And if you look at the pattern, this sort of, there is sort of, you know, something to it. You sort of say, well, this does look like a cluster and these filaments and so on. Even though by the time we were, those we were doing those calculations, we didn't have surveys of galaxies which were that big. But still, so this sounds countless studies, and I will not go to the, to the end of this because otherwise we'll, uh, it will be too late. Well, let's go for the blow up at least. So you see, I mean, this also shows the kind of resolution we get in the computer. And by, now, by nowadays standards, this is already nearly 10 years old. So this is actually poor and crummy resolution. Um, so that's essentially what you get. In, uh, in, uh, and this was in the year 2000. Now, what you can do is actually, since you have the universe in the computer, you can start playing with the recipe. You can sort of say, well, what if, if I put a little bit of more power, some stronger fluctuations on large scales than on small scales? Or what if, if I'm changing a little bit the census of what the universe is made of? I mean, if I add a little bit more of, say, cold, dark matter or versus something else, will it change? And, you know, you can, these were things I was doing while I was a postdoc, essentially. And you can look at this computer in the box and compare with the universe. And progressively, we screen out a large number of them. Okay, and we did ended up having, you know, things like this, where you have the real universe uh, survey here, and here is universe in the computer that have been generated, and you can sort of look whether you think they are reasonable rendition of the other. That's point one. The answer is yes. Now then you can do math. I mean, and you need math, because of course, I mean, you know, this would be very deceptive just to go with, with, with the eye. And so you can start looking in detail and so on, look at correlation functions, all kinds of statistics, Minkowski functionals, you name it. And you know, you start confirming that there is something to it. Even though there is a complexity there, which I'm hiding, which is we don't master all of the detail on how mass gave, gave uh, rise to, to light. In other words, we just map the light distribution in the universe, and this is a mass distribution. So there is some caveat on how the two are related in detail. But let's forget about that. Now, I just told you when I showed you that image that light that was coming from a galaxy on, on the rim of, was taking 2.7 billion years. So let's, let's take another step. So the full sample is actually there. And this green circle is there. And let's look at that scale. Now, just continue the, the travel forward from you, I mean, from us. OK, so you can imagine that you, know, you go further. Well, light has taken even more time to come to us. And then you go further, and you keep going further like this. And at some point, when you, get, when you hit the red circle, you've nearly reached the age of the universe. In other words, on the, red, on the red line here, it's taken about the age of the universe for the light to travel to us. So this is really the oldest image we can get. And it turns out that this is not exactly the age of the universe. This is actually 400,000 years after the Big Bang that we are talking about here. And that's a very special time, because when we go back in time, we are looking at days where the universe was hotter and denser, and also matter didn't have time to condense, as I showed you, so this was pretty bland. So actually, very early on, you had essentially a soup of you know, electrons and protons, just, just for, to make it simple. Okay, so the universe was opaque, you had photons, okay, and photons were just essentially bumping through the electrons, and making a medium that was opaque, like the interior of the sun. And around that time, the universe became transparent. In other words, what happened was that the electrons and the, um, and the protons made atoms. The universe became neutral. The photons didn't have to interact anymore, with, didn't have anything to interact with, and they went essentially straight, straight ahead. So what we're seeing today are the collection of those photons. We never interacted with anything till now. So, when we, 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 when we are looking very far in some particular wavelength that I will come to, we can actually see there, there, something that is akin to the surface of a star like, like our sun. Okay, what we see, is we, we are seeing the surface of the, of the sun, which is like eight, well, it's like eight minutes it took for the light to travel to us. And we're not seeing the interior of the sun because the interior is opaque. I mean, but you see the surface and what you can infer from there is that, you know, well, you look at the surface, you look at, uh, for instance, you see that there are some areas which are of different temperature and so on, and then you infer things on things which are behind the surface, 
this is the solar interior because you can sort of infer from the exterior things about even earlier on. And that's exactly what we'll be doing. That is, we'll be imaging that surface and that will tell us about even processes which in, are even further in time. So let me go to that. Um, so what, what is this? I mean, I, I'll, I'll tell you in a second. The, the previous image was I showed you the galaxies that were all there. I told you if we go further away, we see progressively, you know, further and further away in time. And then at some point, we reach a place where the universe is opaque. And it has, so around us, we cannot see any further. That's what this sort of semi-transparent image is showing you. And that's actually real data. That's actually the real view that we have today of that, of that shell around us. And we, there is nothing special about us, by the way. I mean, if we had somebody in another position, he would also see stuff that is you know, around him at an equal distance. So there, this is not like there is a central piece in the universe. Simply, you, t you look at things which are always at the same distance in time to you, because this was a special event in the history of the universe. So you are looking at a special distance, and so that defines a sphere. But there is nothing special to it. Well, there is nothing special apart from the fact that this is carrying the oldest image of the universe that is available to mankind. And that will remain so for photons, because you, you will never go any further with photons. We might use other particles maybe, but, but not photons. So this is essentially the oldest possible image we can have. And so this is worth going after it. So if I recap, um, we are looking, you know, structures around us, which are really, uh, not at random, uh, which are traced by galaxies. We believe that you know, this can be accounted for by tiny fluctuations early on that grow up out of gravity, okay, till forming this. I showed you the computer animation of that. And indeed, if we go further back in time, there must be a sphere around us at which time the universe become, became transparent. And this, this sphere around us it must be carrying the imprint of the small fluctuations that were present to see the growth of structures. So if we understand all of this, okay, there was a clear prediction that if we are able to look at the microwave background, this sphere is called the microwave background, if we can first get to measure it, then to look at it, there should be tiny fluctuations on it, which will be the seeds, the initial fluctuations, which essentially grew under the influence of gravity to generate the large-scale structure we see today. So this was a quite bold theoretical step at some point to sort of say, well, you know, we see that around us. We believe that there should be, you know, when we go further back in time, there should be fluctuations accounting for what we see around. And then at some point, the technology will be ripe enough that we can actually do this oldest image of the universe and see and map literally those fluctuations. And that will reveal directly how the universe was much earlier on. And then we can compare with our theoretical inferences and see whether these all jibes together. So, okay, I showed you that image and I told you, well, by the way, this image is, uh, yeah, astronomers, I mean, need a way to, uh, to do things on, on, on a sheet of paper, not only on the sphere because this is not very convenient. So this, this is a deformed image, if you wish, of the surface of the sphere. Okay, so you can think of it as, one way to think of it is this will be the equator, this would be the poles. It's just trying to, you know, unfold and the, what is on the sphere. So this is just a way of, of, of mapping the, 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 the sky. So to set the scale, I mean, I, I showed you that this was just a tiny as compared to the, to the full sphere. So this would be, you know, this. And what we believe is actually fluctuations on that sphere are actually the trace of things that happened even much earlier in time, much closer to the Big Bang, not 300,000 years, but like 10 to the minus 30 seconds after the Big Bang, or so, you, or so we think. So in essence, this image, we're picturing the universe in its infancy, but that's also telling us about things which are even earlier in time. And that's what is really interesting, because it tells us even about physics on how the, the mechanisms themselves that allowed us, that allowed to generate the fluctuations. Now, so what this is, is th there is no point in looking at the detail of the curves, but what, then what we need is to, we need a, a mathematical tool to look at this, you know, because you look at this, you just see, well, you know, I see some blue, I see some red, and 
who cares? Well, so you can think of this as the surface of the sea. And how would you characterize the surface of the sea? Well, you see that there are some waves. So when you see a wave, there are two properties. You see how high this is, and what is the distance between two crests, okay? So one is the wavelength of the, the wave length, so the length of the wave, and the, the other one is the height. So if you look at the, at the surface of the, of the, of the sea from, from above, like I'm doing now, well, what can you do? You, you, you cannot count one by one. Well, you can, but that's not very interesting. What you can say is, well, there are many, as that number, or that proportion, rather, of waves of a given size have these, about this height with a dispersion, but about this height. And then you would sort of do plus like this, which would say the typical magnitude of the wave, the uh, typical amplitude of the wave as a function of its length. And the astronomers are doing funny things, so we're plotting this at the inverse, but it doesn't matter. So we have this funny shape here, okay, that sort of tells how, how bumpy is the surface, is that surface, okay, which actually bumpy is a little bit of, uh, of uh, it's not actually bumpy, it's simply a variation of temperature, okay? So it tells what is the, 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 the variations that we see on, on that sphere. So, and that's actually theory. So what we have is something that tells us, well, you know, if we do this measurement, if we go and do all this mathematical transformation on the, on, on the map, then we should see something like this, okay? So that's, that was the theory. Now, um, it's been an all, a long, long ongoing work and, well, you know that the, the, the basic primordial fireball, if you wish, has been discovered by Penzias and Wilson and they got the Nobel Prize for, for it. And within, I think about five years later, Jim Peebles wrote a paper which was already pretty detailed saying, well, you know, there should be fluctuations if, if we understand how things go and, uh, you know, there should be ripples and at some point we will be able to discover that. Well, the predictions were wrong in terms of the amplitude, but the idea was there. At the same time in Russia, Zeldovich and colleagues were doing about the same thing. And so the predictions were there. And then there's been a long ongoing series of, of theoretical work by a few enlightened individuals, which progressively worked out all the consequences, all the way to having you know, a fairly well-defined theoretical prediction and framework to interpret this, that data. Then people actually build experiments, okay? And there are a lot of ones that didn't measure anything. And for a very long time, people were pushing and the thing looked desperately bland. You know, there was just no, none of these things that I showed you, these bumps and so on and wiggles. It just looked very bland and homogeneous at 2.7 degree Kelvin. It's one way of saying it in our units. So uh, at some point, people were starting to say, well, you know, if we keep putting, pushing upper limits on, on this, at some point, we'll be in a big crisis because there won't be enough of these early fluctuations in order to account for what we see around. And that's about that time when we were getting close to the crisis time that the COBE satellite announced its, its discovery. Actually, this is a very interesting experiment. This is the COBE satellite. There's been three experiments on board by these three gentlemen, and two of them got the Nobel Prize. Okay, so this guy, for one of the experiments, which actually did a very careful measurement of, you know, the, 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 the mean, the, the typical fluctuation, the, the, sorry, the typical um, characteristics of the mean universe, okay, around us. So we'll not talk about it, even though this is very important. Uh, so we'll focus to actually this other fellow here. Um, and so here was the situation. I was telling you for, you know, that, that's about, well, not quite my PhD, a little bit afterwards. For a very long time, we were just putting upper limits. You know, these, these little symbols just say, you know, you look at different scales, different size on the sky, nothing and you know with time people have pushed below and meantime the theorist was considering you know the the, the, the various models they were building and every time the, the observers were coming with a lower low limit we would kill a few other models and so on and then that's the big thing i mean you know in 92 bingo we start seeing this and th that's really a, a big change in the field because suddenly everything clicks together you know all the large-scale structure stuff come come and we know that now we have really a cosmogenesis, not, a, not only cosmography, but now we know how to form structures in a coherent way. Uh, in terms of these bumps and wiggles, okay, this is what, they just measure the very large scales. I mean, that's what I showed you in the very first slide. You just see, you know, some, some um, these are the primordial things on the sphere. So you see that the smallest detail you see on this, they saw in the sky was about 10 degrees. 
Okay, so that's a very large uh, size by astro astronomy standards. But that was the first one, so he did also get the Nobel Prize. Um, now, there is a long history that I will not go through. I might go through with some of the students in the coming days, but um, of further experiments that try to go and map out the details and so on. Let, let's keep going. Now, the WMAP satellite, uh, W is for Wilkinson. David Wilkinson is this guy that has been also a prominent Princeton guy in this field in terms of uh, observations. Um, and he actually, so this, he was one of the major guys behind the, the you know, the, the drawing of, of, of that satellite. So that satellite was launched in June 30, 2001. Um, and um, here is the rendition of the microwave sky that, they, that they, they has been obtained by WMAP after one year of uh, data taking. So here is the COBE image. Here is the WMAP image. So you, you sort of see the rate of progress. I mean, not the rate, but the, the amount of progress. Suddenly, things have become crispier. You start of seeing more details. So suddenly, these bump and wiggles that I was mentioning before are starting to be very well known. Now, I'm not going to get into the detail of how you explain this, but simply in that, you know, you can compare this with a, with a theoretical curve, the red one, okay? And that one, you can tweak the parameters of the theory and say, well, what is the one that fits well? And that's the one which fits to, the one that fits corresponds to a very bizarre universe in which the matter we are made of is actually not a majority at all, it's just a few percent. And we have all kinds of dark stuff around us that we don't know very well. And that's what he's, he's telling us. It fits very well, but we have to make an assumption that there is more than what the eye can see. Now, let's keep going. Uh, after data taking for more, after three years, analyzing three years of data, they come with a slightly better image. Uh, and you see this sort of also, uh, not arrow because they have no heads, but rods. And these are actually um, a way of representing another properties of light. It turns out that light can be polarized. Uh, in other words, it's, um, it has a directionality to it. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a principle at work when you use polarized uh, sunglasses. If the light has some polarization and your, your sunglasses are, are killing that direction, well, you don't see anything. And if you rotate things, you re, you, your, your sunglasses, you realize that you either see or, or don't see. All of this is to say, well, there is more to light than only its uh, wavelength, its color, if you wish, and its amplitude or its strength. You need, there are other properties that you can measure. And these properties, you can also make the theory of it. So you can also try to get some more out of this primordial image. And so that's what WMAP did. What you see is that for polarization, we're about back to Kobe days, not even there. I mean, if you look at the rods, there are about 50 rods there, which means over the 40,000 degrees square of the sky, we have been able to only do averages over gigantic patches, about 20 degrees, and that's all we know about polarization. Well, not quite all, but... So we are really on the very early days of polarization. So in other words, we, what, what I just said is, okay, we have an image that has been quite refined by WMAP, which was discovered by Kobe, and we have a, a very early image of the polarization of the early image. Out of this, uh, we have, uh, as I was saying, uh, the, um, we can infer by comparing with various theoretical models uh, that uh, we have a weird universe in terms of census of the various species we have. And essentially, WMAP team has released uh, two more years of data, and it essentially says that this is roughly the same picture. That's why I say WMAP approved. And there is not much more. Now, if, uh, of course, this is just a cartoon. What I've been trying to show here is that within this mathematical characteristics of that image, there is a lot of information there. There are lots of physics, of mechanism that can be used to understand better the universe in which we live. So I'm not going to go into any of this, but the point is that currently, oops, that's not what I'm, okay. We, so we can extract a lot of, of the information and I'm not going to go through this, but the point is we don't know m much of it. What I've been telling you is that this was discovered, this part was discovered by Kobe. WMAP has allowed to map this about till here, 
make some first inkling about what is the distribution there, and all of this is essentially unknown. A lot of the fraction here is not even measured at all. Okay? So in essence, what I'm telling you is we are blessed with much, much more to extract. So it's just out there. We just have to go and grab it. Well, just. So that's essentially the idea of the Planck satellite, which we proposed to the European Space Agency at the same time than WMAP, but we were a bit more ambitious. So it's taking a bit longer to actually put the thing together. We are finally getting to, I hope, to an end. That is, uh, the satellite is ready and it's uh, slated for launch. It will be in Kourou at the end of the year. And the best date I have today is that it will be launched mid-February 2009. So it's getting there. And I will go through a little bit of the slides there. Now let me tell you what is the sort of ambition of, of Planck in a nutshell. It's pretty simple. I remember very vividly when we were listening the, the, the Kobe result, and I was a pure theorist at the time, or nearly purely theorist. Um, you know, we were saying, this is wonderful. Finally, we have this source of information. This would be great to design the perfect experiment. And perfect does have a meaning in that context. Because in essence, when you look at what is the precision of the cosmological parameters you can extract, you see that you need to map essentially the full sky so that you have you know, all of the information, all the way to five arc minute resolution, five minutes of arc, which is pretty small, and that for all, all these waves of different sizes, you need to measure them with a very good sensitivity, which means the detector noise should be small enough. So that's, that's very well, you know, and so you can sort of say, well, that's not quite enough. There is also this galaxy in between and all kinds of stuff that is between me and, well, me, meaning the satellite, the observer, um, and, and the remote background. So we also have to make an experiment that will be robust to this and will be able to separate what is primordial to what is not. And so the design goal was, you know, do it all. With one caveat though, do it all for temperature, okay? And we also said, well, we'll do the best we can on polarization with the technology available, but that doesn't mean that this is good enough to extract all of the information. And indeed, we have already, we meaning cosmologists in the world, are already thinking maybe of a fourth generation satellite if the third one is, 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 um, is a success. Now, what does it translate into? Well, that means we need to measure tiny signals because you know, this means that you must be able to measure essentially billions of a billions of a watt. Okay, so you, you, you don't make any many light bulbs like this. Okay, uh, so it's, it's really ridiculously tiny. To do that, it's already a really mind-blowing that we can actually measure quantities of energy that are that small. To actually achieve this, you need to put the detectors in a very, very cold state. So because otherwise, the warmth is essentially, uh, you know, be, can be confused with, with the energy of the radiation. So you need to cool it down to something which is, you know, well, certainly the coldest uh, spot in the universe made by man. Uh, and to protect the inner sanctum, of you, if you wish, of the, of the detectors, uh, you need to sort of immediately sort of see that you need to protect it with a series of shell, okay? And so, in some sense, what you need to do is to build the satellite from the inside out, which is a little bit contrary to what the space agency typically do, because, you know, they provide uh, a, uh, a service module and they tell you, okay, now you put your experiment and you have that many watts and that many, you know, centimeters and so on, and please fit in that in. Well, it's more or less true. Of course, you you're keep pushing to get more, but that's the idea. For a cryogenic experiment, you cannot do this. You have to do to reverse, essentially, you build a satellite around the experiment because this is so difficult to build a cryogenic chain. In addition to the overall technology and uh, overall architecture, another obvious thing to do is to go away from pollution sources, I mean, particular thermal pollution. Because this thing is a tiny, tiny source of energy. I mean, we're talking of temperatures of 2.7 degrees Kelvin. I didn't mention that, which is very, very little. So it's very easy to confuse this with, you know, the millions of, of degrees of, very, of, of various of other sources. So in essence, go far from, from the major uh, big guys, bad guys, which are the sun, earth, and moon. And there is a point which is called the Lagrange point number two, which is very nice for that. And go there even though the agency will not like this because it's got so much fuel, this is 
more expensive in terms of transmission and so on, but WMAP went there and so did Will Planck. Now, to reach these sensitivity goals, we, in the end, designed two instruments, complementary ones, because uh, no technology uh, would be able at w currently to cover all the frequencies that we, that we actually need. So there is one which is called the low frequency instrument, and these are horns, you know, you see these things. In each, each, this is like, you know, a detector with a horn that is looking at the sky, and at the bottom there is a reception system. So the low frequency instrument is essentially those things which measure the low frequency of light, which is, if you want, the redder part of the spectrum. And then the high frequency instrument, which is there, which I'm co-responsible co uh, for, is this thing. And this is the thing that needs to be a 0.1 degree Kelvin. Okay? And that's the thing that delivers the unbelievable uh, sensitivity that we are talking about. So that's, that's uh, the thing. And at the inside there, you need to, do, to put these tiny detectors and cool them. To, this is sort of an art, uh, artist view of what is the, lo the focal plane looks like. I mean, and you see the sort of transparency, and then there, this is just something about that big. Now, the real, the thing that actually does the measurement on the HFI is something like this, okay? So, this is a grid, okay, but that's a grid which is about that, that large, within a cavity, and that contains on, on the on the mesh, a little thermometer. So what happens is when a photon, a, 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 a grain of light, reaches this, okay, I mean, it goes through the, the horn, it reaches this, it, it deposits its energy, this thing heats up, this changes the resistance of this little thermometer there, and, you know, we can essentially measure this electrically, what is the resistance, and then there is a way to evacuate the, the, the extra heat, so after a little time, this thing goes back to its temperature. So it's not quite a photon counting mechanism, but that's nearly, that's very close to it. And that was actually the design, is, was to be close to the photon noise. So, you know, these are things which uh, you, you sort of see as compared to, to, to a coin, what is the size of, of these little uh, thermometers. Okay, and they are produced with electronic techniques like wafers and so on. So this is inside, and there are like 52 of them uh, aboard HFI. Now, here is a sort of, overall view, the detectors will be, this is a cut out of the high frequency instrument, okay? So the detectors would be uh, there, okay? And the, the, all of this would be several onion shells around with different temperatures and all kinds of functions and so on. And the HFI would be inside the LFI, and the LFI would have its own detectors and sending the signal all the way through to, you know, other parts of the electronics. And you see that how tightly this is putting together and then it goes into the focal plane. I gave you this, and this thing there that I just mentioned is this image. Oops, no, that's, this is this. Okay, so that's, that's this part. And for a very long time, I can tell you in my life, and well, not my, only my life, but the life of all our colleagues, I mean, we have been living with essentially drawing like this. And they, they started from sketches and more and more, and, and at some point we finally saw some hardware. And it makes a huge difference. Um, now, one of the most difficult things about this experiment is that you need to cool it to extreme temperatures, 0.1 Kelvin. The absolute zero that, that cannot be reached, okay, in, in centigrades is minus 273.16, um, and this is at 0.1 degree of the absolute zero. Okay, so that's really pretty damn cold. And so, you know, the, the, the idea is to bring this to that temperature, and then to have a series of shells at different temper each of their own temperatures. Oops, no, wrong direction. And so here is, okay, uh, a, a, a brief view of how this whole thing goes about. The satellite radiates to, to the empty space, okay? So it cools by itself, okay? Because radiating is some of its heat. Uh, it's actually designed for this very carefully to be a very efficient radiator. And that allows to radiate away about two watts and to bring the wool satellite at 40 degrees Kelvin, okay. In particular, around the minimal model that accounts for what we see, there are um, what we call extensions, which are things which might very well be there. They have very often a signature that we could measure, but so far the signature is too small, so we have no constraining power with the current data. That is, a, in other words, 
the effect is too small for the current data to tell us anything about it. Which doesn't say it's not there, it just means we cannot probe it. Well, Planck is designed to essentially extract all of the information we can grab from the CMB concerning the temperature so that we can at least do as well as we can on, on understanding the universe concerning the temperature. Um, of course, I mean, this opens many new possibilities to improve our knowledge. I don't know in which ways. Uh, I can tell you the ones that we demonstrated because there are things we can take a model and say how well we, you, you will do if you had a, a better measurement. Of course, I don't know whether this model will keep being there or not. In any case, I mean, Planck will open a new window on the early universe and I hope it will be a success. And I will be taking questions if uh, you're ready for it. Hello, sir. Yes. Hello. Yes, yes. Hello, I'm, I'm uh, listening. How can you be so sure that the image since the decoupling hasn't been disturbed? That is, you have the exact picture since the uh, decoupling. That, that's a very good question. question. And um, one more question. Uh, how can we conclude that uh, our baryonic matter is in minority? That's all. All right. Let's take the first one. Um, Essentially, what would blur uh, would be essentially having free electrons, okay? Because then they, will, they, they, they would interact, uh, the photons would interact uh, with them. Um, and so we need to have something like, the int we can measure something which is the integrated probability of a photon to having been diffused, okay, on this path, okay? And that's actually something which is less than a tenth, okay? About, about 0.1, okay? So a photon that goes all the way from, you know, this last scattering surface, has about 10% chance to be bumped onto an electron somewhere. So when I say it's undisturbed, well, on average. Now, it's actually not fully true, okay? This is or the order one picture. Now, there are, for instance, suppose you have a cluster, a cluster of galaxies, okay, on the way, uh, on, on, your, on your line of sight. It turns out that this cluster of galaxies is not only made of galaxies. Uh, in between, there is some hot gas because there is a potential well, so the, the equilibrium means that the, the gas is at a hot temperature. Okay, so it's, it's actually ionized, which uh, means that there are actually free electrons there. And, this, and so you, you see the picture, you have this cold, quote unquote, I mean, you know, low energy photons coming and being bumped, I mean, diffused essentially on high energy electrons. So on average, those not, the, not many, but those that will be diffused, okay, will be on average sent, uh, those that go in the same direction, at slightly higher energy, okay? So what you will take is a distribution of photons, okay, which had a particular distribution, which is Planck curve, and you will put to it a very specific distortion, that is, you will deplete the low, low energy side and you will, you know, bump them to a higher energy. In other words, when you will be looking at an image of the sky, okay, if you look at low frequencies, you, know, you will see actually something that is like a, a cold spot. And if you look the same direction, but at, at higher energy, this will look like a, like a hot spot, okay? And you have a very, very specific spectral signature for this, which is the, the very same direction will see something that is a deformation in addition to the primary one with a very specific signature. Well, that's what I was talking about, about component separation. You need to make these various images at different frequencies so that you can go and check whether you don't have, for instance, a, an intervening cluster. And that's just one of them. Now, there's still more, okay, which is actually something very interesting. There is something called lensing, okay, just, um, you, you, you know that light, I mean, the, the, uh, the, 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 the path of light can be bent by intervening mass. In, in essence, what happens if, if you have a big chunk of mass, Essentially, it will have a focusing effect, okay, on photons going around it, okay? That's essentially what, what it is. Now, as I told you, we are looking at this far away large scattering surface through the, last the large scale structure that are being built. I mean, the, the photons traveling from the last uh, scattering surface all the way to my detector is experiencing the growing structure on the way, okay? So, this growing structure, well, the photons were, well, actually, you know, when it sits a big cluster, oops, it goes a little bit in one direction, and then there's another cluster, oops, it goes a little bit in that direction. 
Well, it turns out that these encounters are pretty rare. Okay, so first of all, these, and then it's a tiny deflection. Okay, that's second. And third, you know, it's averaged out a lot because, uh, you know, there is no reason that it will always give me in one direction. So it's actually, on average, it will, you know, it will be like square root of n process. Okay, so on average, it will be a tiny deformation. But still, it's something very interesting because the deformation of the image that you will get is actually, you can infer something about the distribution of mass along the line of sight. And that's actually one of the most ambitious projects on Planck, is actually to use some refined properties to actually go after that, that. So it's actually not quite transparent. It's order one transparent, that is, you know, um, if you are neglecting person type effect, well, yeah, it's transparent. Now, there is more to it, and that's what uh, professionals are doing, and, and uh, younger people are being trained to actually take advantage of that. That was a long answer, but uh, it was... Uh, um, Uh, you are assuming that the light which comes from zero time essentially and you are trying to measure the residual wavelength and temperature and amplitude which work was done by Penzas and his uh, colleagues at mm -hmm. a, uh, Bell Telephone Laboratories. Now this was also explained by some people at uh, um, uh, nearby mm -hmm. and, we, and the whole thing has been built up finally into a string theory mm. because of polarization of light and this new technique is not due to gravitation but the polarization of light by neutrinos um, I'm not familiar enough with, with that uh, uh, so what I'm confused is there is an alternative explanation which was put forth long time ago by Professor Fred Hoyle mm -hmm. and his colleagues, especially mm -hmm. Professor Narlikar, if he is around here. Mm -hmm. And they proposed a steady state theory, whereby they proposed that this universe is expanding not for all the time. Okay, so now let, let so me sort of comment a little bit on this. So your point, if I understand properly, is to say, well, there is not a single explanation for, for this, and there has been alternative explanation that yeah. has been proposed. And yes, indeed, and actually I gave a talk, uh, for instance, in front of giant early car at the Collège de France and gave something in detail on that. So yes, this is normal science. That is, there are some facts, and the people propose alternatives, and, and, and it's, it, it, it's the way it should be, okay? Now, the alternative is at some point, well, you, uh, you have to take at some point a little bit of a peasant approach, which is you need to measure to, to care for a tree as a function of its fruits, okay? And so initially, you don't know. You know, you are, you are essentially looking at all the alternatives and because they look all interesting. Um, and then you build experiments and you look at which theories are the most predictive. And then some of them fall, okay? And then you say, well, but maybe, I mean, this was out of luck. So you go for another round. And at some point, you find that some theories have been always uh, sort of going after the experimental facts, and some are actually before the experimental facts. Now, this is no proof. But if you are investing your time in something, you have to use, you know, you're just sort of saying, well, where should I put my, my effort? And well, usually this is very simple. You think uh, where you go where you think uh, this will be the most fruitful and productive. And so, uh, yes, there's been alternatives. They have been studied. Uh, you cannot really kill a theory. I mean, that doesn't, it's very rare because you can always, I mean, the theorist in inventiveness is, ve is very large, but you can make it less and less appealing. And so the, what you were talking about, at least a number of those that I know have been proven to be not very appealing anymore. 
Okay, but that's, that's, a, that's a timely statement. It doesn't mean this was always the case. Okay, now whether there can be other interpretations? Yes, of course. I mean, I can even tell you a bit more. I mean, um, for instance, this business of dark energy that uh, I, I haven't been talking very much about. Well, there are several interpretations about that. Okay, uh, you can uh, think that there is uh, like a, a, a particular state with a particular uh, way of behaving. That's the standard interpretation, but there are other ways. And people are, for instance, saying, well, maybe general relativity of Mr. Einstein is not the end of the road. Maybe we should consider that on cosmological scales, we don't know enough, and there might be deviation out of this. Well, fine. There shouldn't be theological wars on that. You know, we should sort of say, well, all right, what are the consequences of these alternative theories? Can we find a particular case in which they would differ? Okay? Can we build an experiment to go after that? And that's exactly what we are doing. We are trying to, one of the great things that Planck will do, which I couldn't expand on, is actually set the stage for the other series of experiment where Planck is, will be providing a such detailed view of you know, all of these parameters that now you can build all kind of complementary experiments where Planck is predicting what you should find, but predicting using, for instance, GR, general relativity, or predicting that alternative. Okay, and that's exactly where we're, we're touching it, where why we're continuing to build experiments because we want to check those alternatives, we're being open-minded. Okay, so, you know, but at some point you have to sort of say, well, this particular one, it's not fruitful, let's stop, let's stop it. That was a long answer, but I think this is, it was worth it too. <clears throat> Does this mean that people are desperate for food? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not mental food. I mean, I'm <laughs> Hello, sir. I want to know what gives rise to filament structure. Because you have been talking about data, but the filament structure, computer simulation is there. But what are the physical causes for that filament structure? Um, the combination of statistics and gravity. Um, in essence, you can sort of think of um, gravity is, this, is, is sort of a contrast enhancer, okay? Um, which um, builds up some very specific properties, okay? I mean, there, there, there is something about the very specific nonlinear coupling of gravity that enhances the contrast in a very specific way. If you were to use something else than one over R squared, you would, out of the same initial conditions, create somewhat different patterns. But that's not all of it, because, I mean, there is also what has been set up initially by, and we think that this is one of the very deep questions, okay, that we were debating for well, nearly 20 years, was that, well, could it possibly be that out of random phases, that is just rolling dice in the initial conditions, okay? Gravity could actually generate something that what we were starting to observe, which was these filaments and stuff. And there were two schools, okay, for many years. And um, there, in, in technical language, I mean, there is a lot of non-Gaussianity, okay, to, to say it shortly. Um, and so the question was, is gravity capable of creating these structures out of, of rolling dice? And what these simulations have been showing is essentially the answer is to say, yes, you roll the dice, you look at it, and in essence, the way that gravity contract, I mean, well, enriches the, the already rich in a very specific way, to, thanks to the one over R square law, I mean, can provide that. Now, that's not all of it. I mean, you, you need a bit more ingredients. I mean, this is still a bit more subtle. Um, if you were to um, change it drastically, the amount of power that you put in between the long wavelengths and the short wavelengths, okay, in the initial stage, you would get a very different picture. If you were to put much more than what we think is the case in the small scales, okay, you would get a pretty different picture, okay? You would essentially see everything would be in very tiny little clumps and, and very little large scale structure. Uh, if you were to, on the contrary, erase everything on small scales, okay, very little power, and there are ways to do this, like a neutrino-dominated universe that was popular when, you know, uh, 
around the time I was doing my postdoc, um, then you would essentially have a very heavily dominated um, large scale structure have dominated universe where you would essentially form first filaments, okay? I mean, that would be the prominent thing and you, then you would fragment. You would have a very different ways of, of trying to explain what we see, okay? So there are, there are several elements. So balance of, yes, you can use random phases. You don't have to put it, you know, something very special initially, but you do have to have a number of ingredients which are a certain distribution of power between scales Okay, that we actually inferred from what we saw, that we, we thought we should find this, okay, and a particular force law. And when I say we should find this, this is, you know, I showed you sort of images from the time I was a postdoc, I mean, sort of exactly to sort of say, yeah, you know, we had some idea before looking at the anisotropies, before discovering them, what should be the balance of power between large scale and small scales. And if it had been widely different from what we were in, expecting, then it would have been a problem because it would have meant, well, we don't understand the thing. And that's not the right explanation. So it's a bit complicated, but you, you need initial conditions plus an engine to increase it. And initial conditions, it's not all putting it by hand, it can be random phases, but still you need some property, some balance of property between large scale and small scales and a particular census of the universe that doesn't change too drastically this um, distribution of power in the early phases of evolution, okay? Uh, which own data? Because I mean, uh, Planck is all, you know, virtual, so it's, I don't have any Planck data. Um, yes? Yes, we can make inferences that uh, we cannot uh, do it. It's very hard to do it uh, with, uh, with plain ordinary matter. It's been attempted, of course, but then you have a, a pretty heavy price to pay because uh, then you need to pretty violently, um, to violate pretty, uh, some, some other part of astrophysics. Um, so the, it's in, I mean, the best fit are clearly, okay, with, with, a, with a quantity of, uh, of dark matter, which is what was inferred from large scale velocity fields, from all kinds of things before all of this was detected, right? I mean, um, because th this business of, of, of dark matter, I mean, I didn't know, well, CMB is one thing, but it comes back all the way to Zwicky for, for in the first place, which said, you know, I mean, there are, there are, there are random velocities which are, which are not what we expect if there is only the gravity of, 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 the, of the visible stuff. And that has been ongoing with, with all kinds of astronomical um, measurements like rotation of, the, of, of galaxies and so on. So we had building evidence that there is more than what, what we see, okay? Uh, this has been seen in clusters. Uh, this has been seen in large scale velocity fields. Okay, so all of, uh, but I think the, 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 the biggest evidence really came with, with microwave anisotropies because it's very hard to account for the large scale structure if you don't put dark matter because simply, um, well, we, we don't, I don't want to get too technical, but um, you don't have enough time to grow structures between the last scattering surface and us uh, with just what you would infer if there was no dark matter, if there were no dark potentials. I mean, this can be, you know, we, we can discuss it. This is, the, 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 we can expand on this. Uh, so the CMB was actually the thing that really helped into um, saying that dark matter is needed. N now, how much is, is, is to be a bit debated, right? Um, for a very long time, uh, there was a, the idea that we could uh, maybe live in a universe which was omega total. I mean, that all of the matter would be, well, nearly all of the matter would be dark. But then the observations wouldn't go. I mean, you know, despite attempt, desperate attempts by some of my colleagues, well, you know, no, there was not enough, uh, the velocity fields were, were, were not good enough to, to provide w us with that. Now, so people keep trying to sort of say, well, maybe we can have a more conventional explanation. Maybe the way is to modify gravity and only have dark matter that, you know, this is mom type and, um, this is valid to have discussions among, you know, among us, and we, we are trying to build some tools and, and test of that. And, and uh, as long as it doesn't violate something brutally, well, it's, it's valid uh, academic discussion. Um, 
it's certainly not the most economical now. It's certainly not the one I would spend, you know, most of my years now. But some, somebody should do it. May I have one more moment of your attention, please? Uh, 